Okay, so we're going to look at the Nazi party in the 1920s and there are three main questions. What tactics did the Nazis use in order to try and gain power? And you'll see that those tactics change. Initially, they're about a violent takeover, a coup or a putsch, and after the failure of that putsch, they changed tactics. In what ways, then, was the Munich Putsch of 1923 a turning point in Nazi tactics to gain power? And why did the Nazi party have little real electoral success before 1930? So you'll see that their membership, actually, and organisation increases, but they do not win in elections. In fact, their electoral fortunes decline. Moving on, so what inspired Hitler, if inspiring is the word, to attempt the Munich Putsch is, after all, a pretty uh, dangerous and risky thing to try and take over an armed take over the government. Well, he was inspired by this gentleman, uh, Benito Mussolini, whose Italian black shirts, a, a fascist party, had marched on Rome in 1922 and succeeded in taking over the government. And they were, in fact, the world's first fascist organization. Just a, a minor historical point here. These are a, a Roman officer called a lictor during the ancient Roman Empire. And the things that they're carrying in their hands were called fasces, bundles of sticks, which are supposed to represent unity. In other words, one stick will break, many sticks will not. And it's from these fasces that the name for ultra-nationalist fascist parties gets its name. So basically, 1922, Mussolini's march on Rome is a success. This makes Hitler think he might also stand the chance as well. So that was basically their policy up to 1924, that violence was the way to gain power. Remember, in 1921, the SA, the Sturmabteilung, had been formed, and these were the sort of violent thugs of the Nazi party. As we said before, many were ex-soldiers, uh, ex-members of the Freikorps. They were the battering ram, if you will, of the Nazi party, taking on political opponents, such as the communists, the KPD, in street battles and so on. In November 1923, uh, Hitler spots, in his eyes, a chance. If you remember, the French and Belgians had invaded the Ruhr after the German government had failed to repay reparations. Uh, the government had ordered passive resistance uh, and paid the workers, and basically hyperinflation was causing a lot of chaos and suffering throughout Germany. Now, Hitler thought this would make his opportunity to stage a coup more right, especially when Gustav Stresemann, the German chancellor, called off passive resistance, uh, in some ways to nationalists certainly, making the Berlin government look weak, like they had capitulated, like they had given in to the French and Belgians. So what was the plan? The plan was to use government and army elements to betray the government starting in Bavaria. He hoped to get military support, and of course a coup, a military coup, an armed coup, cannot be successful without military support. Bavaria, a southern state of Germany, was a hotbed of right-wing opposition. Even within the government, there were the local government, if you remember Germany had a federal structure, had local governments called Lander, and the right-wing government of Bavaria was in fact hostile to democracy, the, the whole concept of Weimar democracy. So this is, these are Hitler's hopes that the inflation, the economic chaos, the stressman's capitulation, capitulation means giving in, would inflame support in the public and hopefully he's hoping the military as well. He knew that the right-wing government opposed Berlin and under the Lander system, the state police of Bavaria were separate from Berlin, so hopefully he could get their support. And the police were quite heavily armed. And, 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 excuse me, and with the support of the police and the army, he'd hoped to take over Bavaria and to march on Berlin for a national takeover. Just to have a look at a map of Germany to place that in a sort of geographical perspective. So down there is Munich in Bavaria. It's the state capital of the Lander of Bavaria. Um, the Rhineland is, is what Hitler gives Hitler hope, the fact that Stresemann has capitulated as he sees it over the Rhineland. So he's hoping to take over in Munich and then stage a triumphant march towards Berlin to take over the national government as Mussolini had done back in 1922. Well, the thing is, the right-wing government of Berlin, uh, a guy called von Kahr and von Lassau and von Seisser, they initially they include Hitler in their plans, but basically they then sideline him. They, 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 they exclude him from their decision-making. This makes Hitler very angry. 
Uh, he also sees that they are basically prevaricating, they are delaying any coup attempt. So he thinks it's time, the time is right for him to force action. So he finds out that there is a political meeting in a Munich beer hall. Um, I don't think they're necessarily all alcoholics, it's just that these beer halls were vast places in order that you could hold public meetings there. Now von Kahr was the head of the Bavarian government and he was to be the main speaker at this meeting, together with General von Lossau, the commander of the Bavarian army, and Colonel von Seisser, who was the, st the head of the Bavarian state police. And it's obviously key that Hitler needs the support of both Lossau and Seisser to get the, the police and the army on his side, as well as he's hoping von Kahr, the head of the government. Well, of course, they hold this meeting without him, so he intends to disrupt the meeting with his stormtroopers holding concealed weapons. The plan is that he's going to seize Lassau, Kahr and Sizer and persuade them to join the Nazis in a national uprising against the Berlin government. So, well, what did happen? Well, he entered the beer hall, uh, fired a pistol shot in the ceiling, declared the national revolution has begun, and rounded up Carr, Lossau and Sizer in a back room. He's shouting at them, gesticulating with his pistol. And initially, though, they are quite resistant. They're, they're not keen on uh, being forced at gunpoint to join a national revolution. He tells them he has the support of General Ludendorff, and he appears to gain a reluctant support for, uh, from Carr, Lossau and Sizer. There are some tense hours before Ludendorff finally determines, decides to turn up, I think about 2 a.m., um, and they appear at this stage to give consent to joining the national uprising. Somewhat understandable, considering they were being threatened at gunpoint, though. At this point, Hitler leaves to deal with a problem. Basically, the police barracks are not surrendering to the SA. So he zooms off to try and sort that problem out. Carr, Lossau and Seisser then ask Ludendorff if they can leave the beer hall under the pretext that their wives would be worried about them. They promise that they will carry through with the revolution and Ludendorff, somewhat perhaps naively and foolishly, agrees to this. Carr, Lossau and Seiser then leave the beer hall and what do they do? Immediately they call the police, they raise the alarm. This means now that the army, the state army and the state police are going to be mobilised in opposition to any attempted Nazi takeover. There are no, he basically doesn't have the necessary support Hitler from neither the army nor the police. Uh, the next morning though, despite the fact it's, it would be doomed if he thought it through, um, Hitler, again perhaps naively at this stage, is hoping that he can, uh, uh, excuse my stumbling, he's hoping that he can do a triumphal march through the streets of Munich, mobilise that vast public support and basically overwhelm and hopefully persuade the police and the army to join his cause. So he's hoping for public support. He doesn't really get as much as he's hoping. So they're marching through the centre of Munich uh, and they come up in this area, that, I'm not sure what this, I'm not sure what this area is, it, but sort of an area in the centre of Munich. There's a police cordon, a line of armed police opposing them. A shot rings out and a policeman is killed. The policeman answer with a volley of fire and 16 Nazis are killed. Hitler uh, crawls away, his uh, bodyguard actually takes a couple of bullets for him, he's whisked away in a car to, a, his, to the house of his friend Ernst Hamstegel. Ludendorff, by contemporary reports, being the old military general that he was, stiffly marches towards the police line and is promptly arrested. Well, a couple of days later, Hitler is also arrested. He'd been hiding out in the attic of his friend Ernst Hamstegel, and he's arrested and he's put on trial. The thing is, this is a public trial, which in some ways actually works in Hitler's favour. Although he's found guilty of treason, the judge is really rather sympathetic. And Hitler is allowed to make lots of speeches which are reported on by newspaper men and basically help to spread his nationalist message. And despite attempting an armed takeover in which, you know, more than a dozen people are killed, he receives a sentence of five years, a shockingly lenient sentence from basically the right-wing sympathetic judge. If you remember before, many of the judiciary were quite right-wing and anti-Weimar. So Hitler is sent to Landsberg prison, despite the picture on the left there of Hitler sort of heroically gazing out of the prison bars. His stay in prison was very comfortable indeed. The uh, prison governor was basically a, a supporter, a fan, if you will, of Hitler. He received lots of presents, chocolates, and etc. And he was basically almost allowed to wander the, his wing of the prison 
uh, he was free to wonder. The guy next to him, Rudolf Hess, another member of the Nazi party, listened as Hitler dictated a book called Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf, uh, his initial idea, I can't remember the exact title of it, but it was rather long and unwieldy. Something like three and a half years of struggle against ignorance, lies and cowardice. Um, he's advised by his publisher to shorten it to Mein Kampf or My Struggle. And it's in this book that he sets out a lot of his political philosophy. So he writes Mein Kampf while in prison. So the Munich Putsch is in many ways a turning point. Although it is an abject failure, uh, the Putsch itself is a failure, it generates headline news and publicity at a national level for Hitler. It allows him to go on and defeat his rivals for the leadership. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And in a sense, the Nazi party, you know, it's shown some degree of strength, which you know, interests some particular right-wing backers. It shows Hitler, though, that violence hadn't worked and a change in strategy was necessary. It's at this stage he decides on taking a democratic route to power. This does not mean that Hitler has now become a committed Democrat, a fan of multi-party democracy. He's basically hoping that he can gain electoral support for the Nazi party and then destroy democracy from within. I mean, this, this shows his attitude, we shall hold our noses and enter the Reichstag. Clearly no fan of democracy. So 1924, uh, uh, Hitler gets out of prison. He only, in fact, served nine months in prison, so it's a hardly a lengthy prison sentence. Uh, the couple of, uh, you should make a note of these sort of events in the Nazi party post Munich Putsch. Uh, Brown shirt uniform, the swastika is adopted as an official emblem. Uh, in 1925, the ban on the Nazi party is lifted, so the party is relaunched. And very significantly, an organisation called the SS is also launched. This is different from the SA in that they are Hitler's personal bodyguard and swear a direct oath of loyalty to him. Initially, this is quite a small unit, the SS but you'll see that they grow in size, importance and power later on. In 1926, um, the party reorganises. Each area of Germany uh, gets a GAU, or a, uh, is, is reorganised into what's called a GAU, GAU basically being area, and the GAU Leiter is put in charge of it. So they're attempting to mobilise nationally and gain national support. The Hitler Youth is essentially formed out of a, a batch of other... Excuse me again. Out of a batch of other... Uh, right-wing youth organisations are very significant. The same year, 1926, at the Bamberg Conference, Hitler meets with a lot of deputies from all over Germany. Um, and the Führer principle, the principle of Hitler being the absolute undisputed leader or Führer of the Nazi party, is established. He defeats a rival called Gregor Strasser. Gregor Strasser, although he wasn't openly challenging Hitler for the leadership position, he did believe more in the left-wing elements of the Nazi party. And he was a bit, also a bit more intellectual uh, and thought that many of the 25 points were perhaps badly phrased. He didn't like the anti-intellectual elements. So he's basically Strasser's more left-wing. Um, he was supported uh, initially, Strasser, by Goebbels. But Hitler defeats Gregor Strasser, as we, uh, as, as, you know, as we already said. He becomes the undisputed leader of the Nazi party. Now, Strasser falls into line, and, and Goebbels is uh, somewhat mesmerised by Hitler um, and becomes an avid Hitler supporter. Goebbels is going to become a key figure in the future administration of the Nazi party. Membership of the party. Now, do not confuse this with votes, national votes. This is direct card-carrying members of the Nazi party does increase to 108,000 uh, by the end of, of the 1920s, by 1929. It only been 27,000. So party membership and organisation definitely increases, as do a lot of key organisations within the Nazi party. They did, however, in the 1920s, perform very badly in elections. In 24, you can see that they got 32 seats in the Reichstag. Uh, probably basking in some of the publicity from the Munich Putsch, but the votes are declining throughout the 1920s, and a paltry 12 seats are won in May 1928. So they're doing, they are not doing well at all in the 1920s. Well, why is that? Well, the Dawes Plan, loans from America, uh, had brought in, a, 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 certainly on the surface, a good times. The economy seemed to be doing well. The moderate democratic parties appeared to be handling this economic recovery. It appeared to most people that Weimar democracy was at least working, even if they weren't massive fans of it. They were not turning to extremist groups. 
you know, people's enough food in general, clothing, uh, housing and jobs. Farmers were suffering, um, but they're basically most people continued to vote for democratic parties, not the extremes. Just to summarise, from policy of violence culminating in the Munich Plutch, What's the plutch? What's the plutch? Humanit culminating in the Munich Putsch in 1923. You need to know the plan. You should be able to describe the plan. You should be able to describe the events of the Munich Putsch and how it, how it essentially failed. You should also note the importance of Hitler's trial and imprisonment, especially in terms of uh, uh, gaining extra publicity, the publishing of his views in Mein Kampf, and how the Munich Putsch was a turning point in Nazi policy in making them attempt to achieve electoral success. They did grow in membership, although their electoral success, well, they weren't successful, basically, throughout the 1920s.